the man who wanted to change the world. When Sandy Kidd goes out to the lock-up garage behind his house in Dundee, he is going into a world of his own. This place has been his prison for the past four years. Here, he has spent every minute building a machine. A very special machine, a machine which he says will open up the universe. What I really wanted to do, I suppose, was to create the means of powering a flying saucer, but somehow I could put a machine together using gyros in which all our energy could be properly harnessed to produce a lifting force or thrust which would be capable of driving some sort of craft through space. Like most inventors, Sandy Kidd has paid a high price for his brainchild. It has cost him over £20,000 in lost wages alone. He has turned down better jobs. He has cut himself off from his family. Well, I got so carried away with the thing that uh, I just couldn't help myself. Looking back on it, I don't know how I really was able to subject my family to such sacrifice and hardship. When I was courting Sandy, uh, we used to go to the library when we, when we went out. My girlfriend and her boyfriend, they always went to the dancing, the pictures, but Sandy always ended up in the library. This is where we spent most of the time reading up books on science fiction. He just wasn't like a normal person. He never was. He has what it takes to make an inventor. Uh, the French word, Ingenieur, from which the word engineer is derived, means an ingenious one. And Sandy is ingenious. The ingenuity referred to by Professor Lathwaite is built into this machine. Sandy Kid claims it is unique because it can move on its own, requiring no contact with air, water, or solid surfaces. Which brings us to flying saucers. Many people are convinced that flying saucers are real and are used to transport the inhabitants of outer space between stars and planets. If these magical machines are streaking across the heavens of the universe, then one thing is certain. Their technology is far advanced on anything we are using at the moment. My machine should be able to deliver thrust over long periods of time, years if necessary. This would mean, in space travel, very, very high speeds. The acceleration of the device could also be adjusted to create uh, an effect within the device that would simulate the conditions of gravity that are on Earth's surface. And this would completely eliminate the problem of weightlessness. Mind you, the device has other uses than taking it to uh, Mars in 34 hours. As it says in the patent papers, it is envisaged that the device has application on land, in or underwater, and in space, which means it can be used uh, to power submarines and ships. It might even have the flying motor car. His obsession with this dream sustained him through the years of hardship and sacrifice which it took to turn his idea into reality. He became almost a stranger to his grandchildren, but his wife Janet had learned early on she would have to live with someone who had an inventive mind. He was always talking about uh, space things, science books, uh, Einstein, Asanoff, all this type of thing. I wasn't really interested at that time. I've had to live with it so long that uh, it's just grown on me sort of thing. Having married a man obsessed with travel and space, 
Janet Kidd and her family found themselves seeing less and less of Sandy as he fell under the spell of gyroscopes. The thing was, I still had to carry on my full-time job with an oil company in Aberdeen, leaving home in Dundee before six in the morning and not getting home until seven or eight at night. It was actually in the train that the design of the machine finally came to me. That was around 1982, by which time Sandy had risen to a responsible job in the North Sea oil industry, earning 25,000 pounds a year. But when he arrived back in the evenings to his home in the suburbs of Dundee, he had to start work all over again. He used to come home from Aberdeen at night, half past seven, he'd have his tea. In the door, five minutes, out he went. He was outside till two in the mornings. I just used to go away to my bed and leave him. And this went on for four years. With no social life, we gave up all our friends. Uh, seven nights a week, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, it was spent in the garage. He didn't have time for anything else. To me, he was just obsessed by it. Sandy's machine is all about gyros, a gyro being anything that spins round on the end of a rod. They behave dramatically when subjected to certain forces. This gyro weighs 50 pounds and has been fired up to rotate at over 2,000 revs a minute so that Professor Lathwaite, an expert on the subject, can demonstrate the basic concept of Sandy's device. Very little effort required, about as much as lifting an umbrella and no centrifugal force. Now, of course, we have the problem of stopping it. Professor Lathwaite studied Sandy's machine at the Imperial College of Science and Technology in London. Although known as an international authority on electrical engineering, the professor's know-how in gyroscopes has always led him to believe in the concept of a machine like this, a device based on gyroscopes which could produce a genuine lifting force. When he saw Sandy's invention create such an effect, congratulations were in order. That is fantastic. There can't be any doubt. I mean, there you go, there's a whole object that goes up. By whatever means, it goes up. Is he the first person to have done this? No. Others have done it and inevitably have modified their machines to try and make them better, stop them from working, and they've never been able to recreate the original machine. I've had several like this. So how does Sandy Kid stand then? Well, he didn't make the mistake of meddling with his first machine, he kept it. So that when he made a second machine that didn't work, he said, what's the difference between this and my first machine? It's only the first machine made better. Then he realized he'd lost some of the flexibility through the rather loose engineering of the first machine and was able to see what it was that was making it go. So then he's been able to make a better machine knowing what it is that makes it go. It was while serving as an RAF technician on Vulcan bombers in the early 60s that Sandy first became aware of the frightening energy a gyro can store up during rotation. One day, he had to remove a gyro from the navigation system of the aircraft. I was walking backwards down a ladder, carrying it. Uh, unknown to me, it was still running in its box. And uh, the thing not much bigger than this. And then I reached the bottom of the ladder and turned round. The gyro reacted really violently and threw me on the back. I was really surprised at how much energy contained in a thing about this size. I'll never forget that experience. Ten years later, in 1974, when back in Civvy Street as a development engineer, he watched Professor Lathwaite demonstrate the powers of gyroscopes during a television lecture. What he saw that evening convinced him that somehow he could build a machine to harness a gyro's energy and put it to good use. In deciding on the basic design of the machine, I knew I had to somehow mount two gyros within a structure at a critical angle and by subjecting them to certain forces through rotation and movement, produce a lifting force through the action of the gyros. The whole machine is designed to spin round like a top 
when this happens, the gyroscopes want to fly off the end of their axles because they are being subjected to what is called centrifugal force. With the gyros themselves being driven at a very high speed in a certain direction, they react to the centrifugal force by swiveling upwards and taking the machine with them. Because of its design, it is only able to rise two inches off the bench, but the machine is capable of climbing to any height you want. The machine produces a thrust equal to 10 or 12 ounces, but the device itself weighs seven pounds. To calculate this lift, therefore, Sandy devised a counterweight system consisting of a piece of string attached to the top of the machine, threaded round two overhead pulleys, then tied to an old vise loaded with four-inch nails. When the machine lifts, Sandy gradually removes nails until the device starts to drop. The lift achieved is equal to the weight of the nails taken away. Now, this may all seem a bit crude, but such ingenuity is the stock and trade of the inventor. One of the most important aspects of tackling such a complex project was making all the bits and pieces necessary and juggling them around until I got everything right. Well, being a toolmaker, I could make everything myself, and that was a real bonus. I could set my own pace and get things done my way, building one machine after another, getting the size of the gyros right, mounting them at the right angles, determining the rotational speed of both the device and the gyros so that the two interacted to create the effect I was after. Another of his many problems was deciding how he should drive his gyros. Finally, he chose a 6.5cc water-cooled model aeroplane engine and linked it up to the bottom of his machine. This engine can produce one and a quarter horsepower at 16,000 revs a minute, transmitting that power to the gyros by a belt and pulley system. The machine itself is rotated by being connected up to an electric drill. During my experiments, I burned out more electric motors than I cared to remember about. I was stealing motors out of any gadget I could put my hands on, washing machines, lawnmowers, and things like that. And doing all this, I was working with only a very basic grasp of mathematics and physics, which, of course, are very much involved in this type of engineering. In developing this machine, I've been plagued with setbacks, but having been a development engineer for years, I knew full well that you rarely get anything to work first time. It was very often a question of two steps forward and three steps back. At the weekend, I simply worked on the machine from morning till night. Towards the end, I dreaded having to go out to the garage. It became some sort of hell, but I just kept going. I wasn't happy about it, because at the beginning I didn't believe him, but he persisted and carried on with it, and it was a failure so many times, and he promised to give it up, but he never did. He always gave it a couple of days, and out he went again. And this has gone on for months and months and months. I even got it in bed at night. He brought his books to bed, his papers to bed, he sat and drew pictures to me and tried to make me understand, but I never was able to understand it. I just had to live with it. Although the machine worked for all the right reasons, using all the factors I had built into it, the forces within the device were operating in a different pattern from what I had imagined. In other words, I had created a machine which I did not fully understand at that point, but which was producing the desired effect. It was in trying to establish how these forces and other influences were actually behaving that really created bigger problems than I'd encountered before. Most of the people that know Sandy believe in him. They know that he'll do it. He is quite a clever person, in my eyes. Well, I see a lot of things that don't mean I do try and help him as much as I can. Gardening, decoration, painting, Every job about the house I have to do on my own. He just doesn't have time for any of that. He's too engrossed in his shed with his machine to do any of the things around the house. I've gone out and left him on his own. I've packed my bags quite a few times and been going to leave. But I uh, always came back. During the cold winter months, it became a nightmare. All my family and social obligations went by the board. But the loneliness of working on my own in solitary confinement was the worst part of the home.
After 18 months of building and rebuilding machines, I knew I'd come to the end of the road. If it didn't work now, I knew I had nowhere else to turn. I'll never forget that night.